to the Orthodox Christian Mission Presents. I'm Judith Irene Mate, your host, producer. We're going to discuss some of the history uh, behind the problems we have today with the Papal Church, and its founding will surprise you. Second part of the program, we'll be discussing this book, the My Exodus from Roman Catholicism, by by Bishop Paul de Ballesteros of Mexico City, who was martyred in 1984 by a Catholic fanatic. So we will discuss his work uh, describing how he came out of a Franciscan order in Spain. And it's very, very interesting. Like most stories of converts, you will see a, a especially in his case, we have an archive as a librarian. We have his archives because he was a librarian. As he was asked to collate by his superiors the documents from the Inquisition, we go to the historical part of the foundation of the papacy. There were two warrior churches that arose in the 600s and that is the Frankish Empire, which began in northern Germany, and the uh, Mohammedans, who began here in uh, Mecca. Both had armies, both were conquering, uh, forcing people to either convert to their religion or to be killed. This is a sign of the rise of Antichrist, by the way. When you have religions that have a veneer of belief, but yet the real force is the sword. And we really see it as the Frankish Empire, Kingdom of the Franks it's called, took over and influenced the Rome, Italy bishopric, formerly Orthodox, about the time of Leo III, the Pope in Rome at that time. And before that, we had St. Boniface writing about what he called the German bishops. Let's speak about that a little bit. While the Franks were taking over and conquering, their meeting finally took place in Spain between the Arabs, who had been aligned with the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire, in trying to conquer the West again. Now why do you say did they use the Arabs? Because the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and joined with the Arabs they realized uh, we could keep the Christian witness alive with the Arabs as we paid taxes to them. But with the Franks, there was no way of surviving because the Franks, as they came down into Europe, destroyed, imprisoned, and killed any Roman Orthodox that were in their way. Roman Orthodoxy was too close and in power, and it had to be destroyed. All of Europe, the peasantry, uh, the peasant population, was still Orthodox. And so the Aryan-influenced Franks came down with a very muddled teaching from Augustine. The Hippo gave them a lot of paganism mixed with Christian principles. And this is what they took with their sword and conquered. 
Now, you see a change in the architecture in Europe. You see fortress churches. You see big walls. You see the, the formation of a feudal society. That is, the people in the cities who were orthodox and wanted to worship were oppressed and shipped out into the countryside to work the land for the monasteries or churches which were now controlled by Franks. Now Franks were the free people. That's what Frankish means today. Uh, it's connected with, this, with getting your freedom, gaining your freedom. So to have a Frank, Frankish experience is to be freed. So under this Frankish rule, there was a whole body, a populace, that had to work for their oppressors, for the Franks. We still see this, by the way, vestiges of this, in Great Britain, where you have an openly class uh, society seen as the lords and ladies are still called his lordship, her ladyship, because the Normans, and aligned with the Latin Church, took over Britain in 1066 as one of their last uh, takeovers of an Orthodox society. So gradually, the Orthodox and the Arabs, too, aligned with them uh, down in the south in Spain and southern France, were driven out and their last, I think, the last vestiges of orthodoxy in its Western Empire is uh, Ravenna under Justinian's rule. Justinian, a marvelous saint. Uh, I could, we'll have a program about him, really. He's so, he's incredible. Uh, the anointing and the wisdom that the Lord gave him are just incredible. But until we have that, we'll just move on and say in the 600s the Franks were coming down and 700s they were uh, in the south of France already and in northern Italy they had set up in both places their feudal societies as well as Germany and every place else to the north. So you had these oppressive monasteries so-called run by soldier bishops. Now we get an insight into soldier bishops and their clergy of Charlemagne and his successors as we look at the letters of St. Boniface, the Anglo-Saxon missionary who was sent by the British church into uh, Upper Germany to be a missionary, to bring the holy faith. Now the Celtic faith up in uh, Great Britain and Ireland in the 700s was still very orthodox. It was influenced a lot by, of course, Rome, because Rome made sure to keep a hold on all of its bishoprics. It was orthodox at this time, and they wanted to guard it from the barbarian societies and their heretical beliefs, but they didn't know how heretical they were. So when Boniface got into the area of Upper Germany, he wrote to Pope Zacharias in his letters, and he said, I don't know what to do. You have asked me to align with Christians already there in my uh, area of Germany, but he said, I cannot. They're German bishops, but they're under some sort of Frankish rule that allows them to be adulterers, uh, to be uh, every kind of sinner, drunkards, debauched. And he said, yet they will say 
their mass, and he says their mass, not divine liturgy, and I cannot join with them because they have such unholy lives. So this was the story, the inside story, the eyewitness on the ground story of the Roman Catholic, what would later be Roman Catholic, on the move in the Frankish society, the warrior church that would later call itself Roman, which it was not, and Catholic, which means universal. It was not, it was in Europe only. So the true Roman and true Catholic and Apostolic Church was based in Constantinople. In 300 AD, Constantine the Great became the first Christian emperor. He wanted to establish a new capital city away from the paganized Rome in Italy. He wanted a new Rome far away from the barbarians, which he correctly ascertained would take over Europe gradually and make it impossible to have a church and a society that was civilized. He moved his whole empire into a little town called Byzantium. And that city he transformed into new Rome with libraries, schools, education, a wonderful a metropolis of the arts. It flourished from 300 till 1450 when the Turks battered down the walls of Constantinople and finally took over. The Crusading Church took over. Constantinople became threatened itself. And on the Fourth Crusade, the merchants that were paying for the crusaders on their holy mission, so-called, to take the holy land and make it their own. They stopped at Constantinople and completely obliterated the society. They stole the relics, they stole the beautiful icons, the uh, divine liturgy, the chalices, everything and they ship them over. They can be seen today in the museums of Europe. The beautiful uh, museums that have these incredible works of art and artistry, uh, gold, metal work, all of this related to the Christian faith, reliquaries, the ancient relics of the uh, early martyrs, of the apostles, all these had been kept in Constantinople and in various churches, Antioch, Jerusalem. As they were conquered by crusaders, these were stolen and taken over to the uh, museums in Europe. Also, in the years it was in charge of Constantinople, about 50 years after the Fourth Crusade, shiploads of gold were shipped from Constantinople over to Europe. It, such a glut of monies and gold uh, allowed them to open the banking system. And this can be, this is documented by uh, the historian Father Tikhon, who did a mar marvelous documentary called The Fall of the Empire, in which he documents the fall of Constantinople. And the early, uh, in 1200s, the early defeat of Constantinople, later, two years later, the Turks would be able to take the weakened Eastern Empire seat, capital, and, and make it uh, a Muslim capital, which it is today, Istanbul. So this is the description of the hissing and awful Greek 
church and, and empire and how terrible it was in Constantinople and how, how frivolous, and he mocked it. This is the usual stance of the Catholic and Western viewpoint. The Roman Catholic papacy mocks and ridicules orthodoxy because that's their only weapon, except they rewrote history and they made sure no one knows unless you really dig into these biographies like St. Boniface and his letters and another biography that is valuable to us, uh, Kirill and Methodius, the two that are here on my uh, side, these were the missionaries to the Slavs. They also speak of the German bishops. This was in 800, a little bit later than Boniface, 200 years later. And they were badly treated. They were, of course, uh, the Latinists, the Latin Germans did not want the populace to be able to understand the divine liturgy. When Kirill uh, translated and made into a written language the Slavic language, he translated again all the services into the native tongue of the people. This is what we do. This is what's proper. This is what should be done in America wholesale, and we are doing it in the Jerusalem Patriarchate parishes. All English, so that the children and the Americans who are converting can understand and pray in their own language to the God of our fathers. My Exodus from Roman Catholicism by Paul de Ballester began as a young man, Christian, then converted to Roman Catholicism in Spain. That was the main church that was witnessing to Christianity. And as far as he understood at that time, he was entering into the ancient church. Well, as a young man, he was given the task of organizing the archives relating to the uh, Inquisition that took place in Spain from 1500s through the 1700s. But after that, the French Revolution stopped all of the, uh, with their guillotine, they stopped all of the Catholic Church meddling in the monarchies of Europe and until that time, the Roman Catholic papacy was able to, uh, to have its way among the nations. Now, as this dear Franciscan monk would understand, as he read the archives, he saw, to his own disbelief, that you could be burned at the stake if you believed that St. Paul was equal to Peter in his apostolic mission. Of course, we know as Christians who read all of Scripture, all of St. Paul's letters, that all of the apostles were equal. St. Peter, the head, I think, Bishop of Antioch at one point, but he and St. Paul both were missionaries one, uh, Peter, was missionary to the Jews, and Paul was missionary to the Gentiles. St. Paul describes this. St. James, as we see in the book of Acts, at the first council of Jerusalem, was the head of the Jerusalem church. He had great status. He was revered by the Jews in Jerusalem because of his great righteousness. Very holy man. He got together the first divine liturgy and the first understanding of 
the uh, Holy Eucharist as the Paschal meal and replacing it as, as the mystical supper in which we partake of the incorruption and immortality of the God-man, Jesus Christ, through his divinized humanity, through those energies in his human nature. And our dear Bishop Paul, he's later Bishop Paul, would discover by saying that scripture was above the basis of the Roman papacy would be excoriated, much to his disbelief as he started speaking with his superiors, they said the Pope was above scripture. He was told to read only the uh, church documents and to ignore scripture. This to him as a Christian man, he was Christian before he became Roman Catholic, was abhorrent. He knew that everything in Christianity was based in holy scriptures, in the physical and in the historical context of the church what to do. And I'm giving you just a synopsis. It gives much more detail, of course. He would explore the Protestant faith. He would explore uh, much of the uh, Anglican. They became his friends as he left, eventually, the Roman Catholic Church and his Franciscan order in Spain. Thankfully, he, as he says wisely, had, uh, had his orders sign the fact that he was leaving in good, with a good reputation and that it was his choice to leave. He was not driven out. Because later, the Uniate Church, those churches that pretend to be Orthodox but are under the Pope, in Greece would try and slander his past, as they did by the way, John Romanides, whose history we are, uh, we are giving you at the beginning of this program. Here are some quotes from uh, the popes in this century explaining their role as, under the Frankish uh, rule, of course, of secular and religious power, both. The pope, quote, is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of the flesh. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who speaks. Does the Pope give a favor of pronouncing an anathema? It is Jesus Christ who pronounces that anathema. So that when the Pope speaks, we have no business to examine it. This is Pope Pius X, who was made a saint, by the way, uh, by this very church. Another pope, John Paul II, quote, The Pope is the man on earth who represents the Son of God, who takes the place, quote unquote, of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. That's from his writing, Crossing the Threshold of Hope. What this Pope doesn't realize is that taking the place of Christ is the very definition of the Greek term Antichrist. And not to be outdone, uh, Pope Leo XIII in the century before last says, We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. And by the royal we, he means the papacy. We hold upon the earth, quote, the place of God Almighty, unquote. Thus says Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Also from the Greek text of Holy Scripture, we have Thou art Peter, the favorite Matthew sixteen eighteen used by the, the Papal Church. We have Peter being called Petros by Christ. And upon this rock, a different identity, Petra, feminine. It is related by most of the church fathers to the word pistis, which is faith in the Greek and is feminine. The foundation of our faith is 
what saves us, which the gates of Hades cannot prevail against. The whole entire content of our faith is defined by Holy Scriptures and by the commentaries, which are the tradition, the holy tradition, of the teaching of the successors of the apostles. Not just by laying on of hands, but those who truly taught the teachings of the apostles passed down carefully, as 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, uh, tells us that is done by St. Paul, and is done by all of them. The main teacher we have in the early church is, by the way, the Apostle John. And the Apostle John was allowed to live a long, very long life, escaped many uh, attempts to martyr him. So we have all of the churches of Ephesus and the churches of St. Andrew in the apostolic time, from the apostolic period, St. Mark in Egypt, St. Thomas went over to India. We have the apostles witness all over, not just Peter. Peter was, uh, was a major head of the apostles because of his relationship with Christ, but not above, but part of the holy apostles' witness. In Peter's epistles, he tells his people that he's writing to, to read St. Paul for all of Scripture, that means St. Paul is Scripture, is for our building up of the church. So we have this from St. Peter himself. But yet those who claim to be part of him have gone left, left their senses in trying to make themselves above and beyond even Scripture itself. One of the Jesuits that he quotes On page 73 of uh, my Exodus book, he says, a priest of the Jesuit order and a long-standing friend confided in me, quote, everything you say is unquestionably logical. I have no reason not to accept it. However, we as Jesuits must especially abide by our fourth vow, which is obedience and unfailing submission to the Pope. For this, I am obliged to be thrown into eternal condemnation with the Pope rather than be saved with all of these unshakable truths that you present. Cardinal Bellarmine, a Jesuit and sainted as part of the Catholic Church, presents in his Theologia book, if one day, quote, the Pope fell into the error of imposing sins and prohibiting any virtue, the church would be obliged to believe that sins are beneficial and virtues are bad. Alternately, she would be committing a sin against her conscience. Here is the church saying that the Pope can say good is bad and bad is good, and he would be right no matter what scripture or even the Lord Jesus has said. But the obedience to the papacy was one of their founding elements. It's a vow that Jesuits take of obeying the Pope. And he said that means that we would rather follow the Pope into hell, into what he says is virtue but is not, because of our obedience, than to follow the truth of scripture, because we are vowed to the Pope, and he is the leader of heaven and earth. There is also a whole section Art on the papacy and endows what? itself with great pompous and arrogant power. It is not only a religious power over all Christian churches, no matter, it is also over all secular powers. This is the reason that you have pedophile priest Bernard Law, the cardinal from Boston, who was under indictment, fled to Rome and was given harbor by the Vatican behind its walls. There are several priests like that uh, being guarded in the Vatican from any extradition to Mexico in one case, 
to other countries because they are under the gun of the law because of their sins against youngsters in particular and of course against the people of God.